All right. Well, good morning, High Point. Hey, listen, if you are new here today, my name is Will, and I serve as one of the elders and pastors here at the church. And uh, this morning, we are continuing our series through the Sermon on the Mount. And our passage today comes to us from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and we are going to be looking at verses 25 through 34. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And I would love for you to please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 6, verse 25 says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. Everyone say anxious. Anxious. About your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious, everyone say anxious, about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, everyone say anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first, everyone say first, First. the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, as we come before you today, we want to thank you, God, for another day. Lord, we are grateful for the fact that your mercies are new each day. God, we are told in this passage by Jesus that by our king, in his inauguration speech, God, he is is telling us that there will be trouble. There's enough trouble for every day but we thank you that your mercies are new each day. And we thank you also for the fact that you promise us that when we pray to give us daily bread. And so even though troubles are new each day, so is your mercy, so is your grace, so is your provision. And so Lord, I pray right now for this day, for this moment. I ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that whoever in this room, Lord, is struggling with anxiety, Whoever in this room, Lord, is, is, is going through suffering right now, whoever in this room, even in light of what we talked about on Easter Sunday, is doubting right now. God, I pray that this passage uh, would, it, it, I pray that it would cut, but that it would be like a surgeon's knife, Lord, that it cuts temporarily, but for the purpose of healing. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. And I pray, God, that you would help me uh, to not only uh, communicate this in a way that is clear theologically, but I also p- pray, Lord, that it would come off pastorally. God, I pray that this would not come off as condemnation, but I pray that it would be just me preaching what you have said in this text. Lord, prepare the soils of our hearts, we pray, for the seeds of your word and for the seeds of your work. Lead us, Lord, guide us, and be here among us, we pray. We ask it and we beg it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You, you may be seated. All right, so this morning, uh, what we're going to do is we are going to be looking at this passage, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Uh, We're going to be looking at it under two headings. So we are going to begin today by looking at the response to anxiety, and then we are going to conclude by looking at the redirection of anxiety. So we're going to look at the response to it, and then the redirection of it. But I want to begin this morning by looking at the response to anxiety. You see, because in this passage, 
Jesus provide, provides us with a biblical response to unbiblical anxiety. And what we're gonna see is that in this text, Jesus essentially provides for us a three-part response, a three-part argument against the anxiety that plagues many of our lives. But before we jump into uh, this response and, and really dive into this argument that Jesus gives us, before we do that, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna give you a quick disclaimer and then I wanna give you a biblical definition. So before we look at the argument, I wanna give you a disclaimer and a definition. The first thing I wanna do here on the front end is I wanna give you a quick disclaimer. And if you know anything about me, I don't usually give disclaimers. Uh, I think pastors can sometimes use disclaimers because they're too scared of saying certain things. Um, that, that's not what I'm doing here. But, but the reason why I am bringing one up in this topic of anxiety uh, is because I have been alive long enough uh, and I have been a pastor long enough to see this very important dynamic. Um, and so I wanna make this disclaimer here on the front end, just so you understand what I am talking about throughout this message. And here is my disclaimer. I would argue that as a result of the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, sin permeated everything in creation. And so as a result, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we have been affected, not just spiritually, but emotionally and chemically. Literally at the physical level, we have been affected by the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, the reason why I say that is because what I would argue is, is that as a result of the fall, there isn't just general anxiety, which we all struggle with, which is what we're gonna be talking about this morning. But I would argue that there's also clinical anxiety. And, and this is something that people in my role, pastors in my role, don't ever bring up in church. And if you struggle with anxiety, then you just have a sin problem that you need to repent of. And like I said, I, I feel like I've lived too long and I've ministered to too many people to, to not be able to see that there are actually two types of anxiety. That because of the effect of sin, of original sin, because of what happened in the garden, sin has affected us not just at the mental or psychological level, not just at the emotional level, but quite literally at the chemical level, at the biological level. And so as a result, I would argue that there are two types of anxiety. There is general anxiety, which is what Jesus is talking about here, and then there is clinical anxiety. Now, now let me explain to you the difference between the two. General anxiety is what many of us deal with, right? General anxiety tends to come up when there's something specific in your life that you're wrestling with, right? There's something going on in your life that you're, that you're wrestling with. And, 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 and because you are wrestling with something specific, you tend to have a very realistic response to this thing that's causing anxiety in your life. The, the anxiety, when you have general anxiety, doesn't tend to be excessive in nature. Even though it can be, it doesn't tend to be. And even though you're wrestling with anxiety, it, it doesn't necessarily impact the quality of your life. You see, but clinical anxiety is very different. Clinical anxiety, and this is just based on my research and study of it, and literally seeing it play out in front of me, clinical anxiety tends to be unspecific in nature. It's not like there's one thing in particular that a person's anxious about. They're just anxious in general. Uh, the, another, another symptom of clinical uh, anxiety is that it doesn't tend to be a realistic thing. It's a very, it's, sometimes it can be very unrealistic what you are anxious about and worried about. It tends to be more excessive. And as a result, it impacts the quality of your life. Like literally, you are affected. The rest of your life is affected because of clinical anxiety. And, and as, when, when you study this and when you read this, essentially what you discover is that this is a mental illness. That people literally, because of sin, have been born with this clinical anxiety. So I, I feel that making this disclaimer is important because coming after someone who has clinical chemical anxiety and saying, buck up, 
why are you so broken and sinful, right? Would literally be like someone coming at me because of my ear deformity that I was born with and saying, why do you have scars on your body? Well, you have, you have that ear deformity because there's sin in your life. You see what I'm saying? And so I wanna make that distinction for two reasons. One, because that distinction is not usually made in church, but also because I'm going to say some pretty hard things about general anxiety, and I wanna be able to make those claims without condemning people who are struggling with clinical anxiety. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is my disclaimer. Now, before we look at the response that Jesus gives us, I also wanna give you a definition. What does Jesus mean by anxiety? I think many of us will be surprised uh, about what the actual definition of anxiety in scripture is. You see, because in this passage, when you look at it at the, at the surface level, it doesn't seem very pastoral what Jesus is doing here. He literally begins with, do not be anxious. And I don't know if you've ever dealt with anxiety yourself or you've ever dealt with someone who's being anxious. This isn't usually the way you deal with it. You don't just tell them, hey, stop it. <laughs> On the surface level, it seems as if Jesus is not being gracious, like he's not being pastoral. But I think the reason why he can command us not to be anxious is not just because he's God, but it's also because of what his definition of anxiety actually is. The, the word there in Greek for anxiety is the Greek word uh, metamineo. And, and here's what that word means. It, it literally means to not be, it, well, it literally means to be not concerned, but over concerned. It, it doesn't mean to care. It means to be full of cares. Here's what people don't understand. I think this is why this text can be preached wrongly. There are other places in the New Testament where this same Greek word, metamineo, is used in a positive way. So in 1 Corinthians 12, for example, or in Philippians 2, for example, you, say, you see the same Greek word, but it's used not in a negative way, but in a positive way. And literally what Jesus and Paul are saying in those texts, oh, actually Paul in both cases, what he's saying is, he is saying, make sure you care for one another. Make sure you are concerned for one another. So, so get this, the word metamineo is not necessarily a bad word when it is in its proper context. It means to care for something. It means to be concerned about something or for someone. Jesus here says anxiety is when we have over concern. When we don't just care, but we are full of cares. You see the difference? Because your response might be, okay, well, if Jesus is saying, do not be anxious, do not uh, uh, be full of cares, then I'm going to go ahead and be free of cares. I'm not going to care about anything. That, that's, the, that's the exaggerated response. If he's saying not to be full of cares, then I'm going to be free of them. Right? If he's saying, don't be over-concerned, then I'm going to be completely unconcerned. That's not their response. That's, that's an exaggerated response. The Greek word metamineo, when it's healthy, it means you are concerned and you do care but you're not over-concerned. You're not full of cares. Are you tracking with me? Okay. So, so the Greek word here, uh, metamineo, in the way that Jesus uh, says it, the, the way that he, that he writes it here in the Greek, literally the word picture is of an individual being pulled in multiple directions. That's the word picture in Greek. When you are struggling with this metamineo, the sinful metamineo, this, this over-concern, being full of cares, it's literally an individual being pulled in multiple directions. The, the word picture there in Greek is of being strangled or being choked. And anyone who's ever struggled with anxiety here, you know that's, that's what it feels like, right? It feels like you're being pulled, but man, it, it definitely feels like when anxiety is bad, there's this, 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 you feel like you're being choked. You're being strangled by, by your circumstances. And another thing that's interesting about this word uh, metamineo is when you are overly concerned, get this, not with actual things, but with potential things. Not with, actual, well, not with the actual, but with potential. Literally in the Greek, it means someone who is concerned, overly concerned about things that might happen, about possible danger and possible misfortune. 
Not actual, possible. That's what the word there, metamineo, means. Jesus isn't calling us not to care. He's calling us not to be full of cares. He's not calling us to not be concerned. He's calling us to not be over-concerned. You see, because here's, here's, here's the temptation, and this wasn't even a part of my notes, but, but I, I feel like God wants me to say this right here. The, 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 I remember I, we, Lily and I were getting counseling once, and, and here's the, the, the image that was used. He says, when, when, we try, when we're anxious and we try to have, we try to, we're over-concerned, we're full of cares, instead of doing this, we do this. Like we hang on to whatever that thing or person is. We're holding on, right? But then when, when our anxiety doesn't work, instead of repenting and opening up our hands again and caring, just balance, we do this. Forget it then. See the difference? That's why the word metamineo is not always wrong. It's not always bad in Scripture. When we're anxious, we're like this. And when anxiety fails us, which it always does, Jesus says there's no benefit to it at all, actually. Our response, instead of doing this and going back to from over cares to just caring, from being overly concerned to just being concerned, we, we swing. We go from over-concerned to unconcerned. We go from being full of cares to being free of cares. This is not what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to do this. That's what we see here in this text. Here's the other thing too. And I wanna make sure you guys are tracking with me here because this is an important piece. Biblically speaking, the reason why we struggle with anxiety, according to Scripture, and I'm going to show you examples of this, according to Scripture, is because when we are struggling with anxiety, again, this is general anxiety that we're talking about here, when we struggle with anxiety, we have forgotten that we are the steward of the house, not the master of the house. You see, in Jesus' day, if you were a wealthy family with a wealthy household, every household had a head steward. They were literally the ones that ran the whole house. They ran the finances. They raised the kids. That was the steward of the house. That's what we've been called to be as God's people. But just like Adam and Eve, who they were called to be stewards of the garden, they weren't content with just being stewards. They wanted to be masters. And one of the reasons why uh, uh, Satan is able to tempt Eve is because he says, you will be like God. You will go from being creation to being creator. You will go from being the servant to being the owner, to being the one with power, to being the master. And I would argue at the heart of all of our anxiety, biblically speaking, is this desire to usurp God's power, to take control and authority that only belongs to God. That is the argument that I, that I think we see in Scripture. That anxiety happens when we forget that we are creation and we try to act like the creator. That's when anxiety happens. And here's the thing. Every single person here, including the person who's talking, we all struggle with some illusion of control. Like when, when things are going well, and our daily plan worked out, and our weekly plan worked out, and our three yearly goals are working out, man, we, we fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I might be in control here. This is my will being done. You see, but I would argue that anxiety happens, and we talked about this in Easter, I would argue that doubt happens when something comes into your story, your overall narrative that doesn't fit. Something it literally in, it comes into your worldview that doesn't fit your worldview of the world. That's when anxiety happens, when you get that call from the doctor or you get that unexpected bill or your, your child is, is suffering or struggling or sinning. Whenever things get difficult, whenever shaking happens, Hebrews 12, whenever the winds blow and the storms come, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, all of a sudden we, we start seeing just how shakable our life is, how much sand we still are living in, and that illusion just crumbles. And anxiety happens, not because we have less control than we did before, just because we're aware of it now. We were never in control. All God did is give you an opportunity to see that. 
So when the illusion of control crumbles and we realize that we're not God, that we are the steward and not the master of the house, that's when anxiety happens. That's when fear starts to come up. Here's the thing that no one tells you about anxiety. When you try to take God's crown, you also have to inherit his cares. No one ever tells you that part. When, when you try to take God's throne, you also have to inherit his thoughts. You take his place and now you got to worry about all the things that he worries about. But guess what? You are underqualified for that job. But praise be to God that our father is overqualified for that job. So, so biblically speaking, the opposite of anxiety is faith. The, the opposite of anxiety is trust. We, we said that, we've said this numerous times that the word faith in Greek literally means to rest on something, to lean your whole body on something. Physically, metaphorically, spiritually, that's what the word there, faith, means, to lean, to trust. Well, literally, anxiety is the opposite of that. The, opposite, the, the anxiety is when I'm not leaning on God, I'm leaning on my self. It's literally the opposite of faith and trust. One of the commentators I looked at this week, Dr. Robert Mounts, put it this way. He said, worry is practical atheism and an affront to God. Practical atheism. And then Peter says it like this. Look at Peter says in 1 Peter 5. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties, everyone say anxieties, on him. Why? Because he cares for you. You know, what I love about this passage, 1 Peter 5, is that Peter wrote this towards the end of his life. And if there's anyone who was, who struggled with anxiety and worry, it was Peter. A lot of his things that, that made him seem actually courageous were actually motivated by anxiety. He takes out the sword in the garden to, to try to defend Jesus. He's worried about whether they're going to pay taxes or not. He, 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 he falls into the water because he gets worried. He gets anxious. Like this guy was marked by worry. And what I love about this is that one of the words we're going to look at here in a second is the word consider. And the, the word consider, one of the meanings is the word to learn. So, so what, I, what I want you to see is that th this might seem really hard to you, what we're talking about right now. Like, how can I ever be this type of person? But what we see is that in light of that Greek word consider, and even in light of the example of Peter, it takes time to deal with your anxiety. In other words, if you're struggling with anxiety right now, it isn't just going to be one sermon that's going to fix that. Which again, I think is another lie that pastors tend to promote. But you, you learn. The word there, consider, means to learn. That over time, I learn not to do this, but to do this. I slowly open up my hands. Because that's exactly what Peter did. Peter went from being a very anxious, worried person to at the end of his life, he's writing this passage. And something that I want you to see, which I don't know why we overlook, we love verse 7 where he says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Amen. The problem is, is that Jesus says, sorry, Peter says that the reason why we are holding on to our anxieties is because we're prideful. He says, humble yourself. And how do you hum humble yourself? By casting your anxiety. So in other words, when you keep your anxieties, when you try to carry the weight of things, it's actually a sign of pride. You're taking the place of God. That's what he is saying there. That's why in, in Philippians 4, where it says, do not be anxious about anything, but to pray about everything. I think that's what he's getting after. That, that, that to the degree I don't, I don't pray about anything, to that same degree I will be anxious about everything. But prayer is literally the process by which I take my anxieties and cast them on God. That's what he's getting after here. 
That's what we are seeing. So with that disclaimer in mind and that definition in mind for the word metamoneo, for the word anxiety there, with those two things in mind, what I want to do with the rest of this first point is, is I want to look at the actual response that Jesus calls us to have when it comes to the anxiety in our lives. And, and here's what's interesting about the three-part response that Jesus is calling us to take. They all have to do with how we think. Jesus in this text, he's actually call us, calling us not to feel our way out of anxiety, but to think our way out. You see, in the church, is we're, we're, we're all about just emotional faith. I got, I got here emotionally, so I got to get out of there emotionally. Jesus doesn't, that's not what Jesus is teaching us. Jesus is saying the way to get out of anxiety is to actually think your way out. The reason why you're anxious is because you are overfeeling and underthinking. That's what he's arguing. And we know that this is not just my opinion. We know that Jesus is telling us to think because there's two words that he uses in the text that are thinking words. The, the first word is the word look, where he says, look at the bird's of the air. The word there is an imperative. He's commanding it. But literally the word look in Greek means to process information by giving an exhaustive consideration to it. Exhaustive. That's what the word there look means. So when he says look, he's not talking about a passive glance. He's talking about thinking deeply. And then the other word that helps us see he's, that he's calling us to think is not just the word look, but he also uses the word consider. And the word consider there in Greek literally means to carefully examine and think about something in order to experience it, learn it, and understand it. So both the word look and the word consider, what they reveal to us is that Jesus is not telling us to feel our way out. He is telling us to think our way out. The reason why we are anxious is because we are overfeeling and underthinking. We are allowing our hearts to overrule our heads. So, so in this text, he, he literally gives us a three-part argument, a very rational argument for why we should not be anxious. The first reason, if you're taking notes, is the permanence of God. The first argument that Jesus gives us is the permanence of God. The, the second argument is the provisions of God. And then the third argument is the paternity of God. So we're gonna look at each one. The first argument that Jesus gives us in response to anxiety is the permanence of God. Now, where do I see that? Well, at the beginning of the text, again, this is something we can read right past if we're not careful. In verse 25, Jesus begins with their four. Their four. In other words, he's saying the reason why you should not be anxious is because of what I said right before this. But if, it, but if all you do is look at these verses, you're not going to fully understand what Jesus is trying to say. Remember, this was a, a sermon. He, he wasn't looking at it week by week the way we are. So Jesus says, in light of what I said before, therefore, do not be anxious. But the question is, what did Jesus say before? Well, immediately before this, for those of you who were here last week, you know that he talked to us about treasures in heaven. Essentially, Jesus showed up and, and, and during this message, he exposed the fact that there are two types of treasure. They're, and, and they're different, not just in location, but in longevity. The, the two types of treasure are different in location and longevity. They're different in location because he says some treasures are on earth and some treasures are in heaven. But they're also different in longevity because he said the problem with treasures on earth is that they shake. They're shakable. He says that the moth can eat them. The vermin can destroy them. The thief can steal them. So right before this text, he talks to us about the different types of treasures. And then at the end of it, he says, so we all have an option. We will either serve God or 
mammon, which in Aramaic means something that is trusted, something that we are trusting. So you either trust and serve the creator, something in heaven, or the creation, something on earth. Jesus says that if you choose God, if you choose him, Jesus, we said last week that he is the ultimate treasure. He is the treasure of treasure. If you choose him, then there's no reason to be anxious. If your treasure is ultimately in heaven and your treasure is ultimately Jesus, he says, therefore, do not be anxious. If you do what I said in the previous passage, there's no reason to be anxious. Amen. You see, but if your treasures are on earth, if your treasures are your looks, we said this last week, if you worship your looks, you're always going to feel ugly. If you worship money, you're always going to feel poor. If you worship being skinny, you're always going to feel fat. If you worship success, you're always going to feel like a failure. When you have earthly treasures, those treasures are shakeable, stealable, eatable, destroyable, and as a result, you will always be anxious. But Jesus says, if God is your treasure, if the gospel is your treasure, he says, if I am your treasure, then I can command you to not be anxious because what can anyone do to God? If God is where he needs to be in my life, there's no anxiety. There isn't because what can man do to me and what can man do to him? So the first reason why we should not be anxious, according to Jesus, is the permanence of God. God is permanent and our earthly treasures are not. The second reason why Jesus says we should not be anxious is not just the permanence of God, but the provisions of God, the provisions of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in this passage, Jesus says, I love this, this part. It's towards the end of the text. He says in verse 32, and your heavenly father knows what you need or that you need them all. He says that our heavenly father knows what we need. And the word there knows in Greek, it, it literally means to remember something, to perceive something, to possess information about something. So when he says that our father knows, it, what he's saying is in heaven, we have a father, we have a God who remembers us, who sees us, who perceives us, who possesses information about us. He actually knows us better than we know ourselves. And I love the word there, need. He says he knows what we need. The word there, need, literally means to lack something that is particularly needed, to lack something that is necessary, or to lack something that is categorized as a necessity. So the second reason why Jesus says we should not be anxious is because of the provisions of God. That in heaven, we have a God who knows what we need. And then he uses the example of birds and of flowers. He says, look at the birds and look at the flowers. If he provides for them, how much more will he provide for you? See, Jesus is using a very common uh, type of form of arguing in, in, in the Jewish culture. In the Jewish culture, you would, you would technically, usually what you would do is you would argue from the lesser to the greater. So you would take a lesser example and then that would point to the greater example or the greater argument. So he says, if God can take care of the birds and the flowers, how much more will he take care of you? That, that's what he's getting after. And what I love about the example specifically about birds is that birds, they work, but they don't worry. So again, this, that's that balance, remember? You can't go from being over-concerned to being unconcerned. You can't go from being uh, full of cares to being free of cares. There's a balance. Birds, they work, but they don't worry. See? 
So he, he's using, he, he's, he's saying, look at how God provides for the birds. Look at how God provides for the flowers. And if he provides for them, how much more will he provide for you? And really the reason why God cares more for us than he does for birds and flowers is two reasons. One is because of creation and the other reason is because of salvation. He cares for us more because human beings are the only thing in creation that are made in his image. So because of the first Adam, God cares more for us. That's creation, right? We're made in his image. But because of the last Adam and the work that he did for us, God also cares for us because of salvation. Because those who are in Christ, because remember this whole sermon is for the people who know Jesus. This is for disciples now. He says, for those who are in Christ, you have a father who loves you and provides for you. So because of creation, the first Adam, God loves us more than anything else in creation, but also because of salvation, the last Adam. So because of the first and the last Adam, God loves us infinitely more than he does birds or flowers. That, that is the argument that Jesus is providing for us here in this text. But, but something that I want to make sure uh, uh, we all understand here, okay? In the passage, Jesus says, because remember, we're looking at this second argument, the, the, the provisions of God. It says that God provides what you need. Okay? So, so I, need, I don't know if you got a highlighter. I don't know if you got a pen, but I need you to <laughs> double, triple highlight that word. God provides what we need. need. Everyone say need. need. You see, many of us, we're not anxious about our needs. We are anxious about our wants. Because you know he's talking about needs because he brings up food and water and clothes. And I'm not saying people here in this room have never struggled with that, but by and large in our nation, I don't know when the last time you were worried about where your next drink was going to come from or if you had clothes to wear tomorrow or if you were going to go hungry or not. See, the problem with the Western world is that because most of our needs are met, we don't have any reason to be anxious about that. So we go be, we have to be anxious about something. So we end up being anxious about our wants. Not what we need, but what we want. Since we have all of our necessities, then many of us are anxious not about our necessities, but about our luxuries. We want more zeros on our check, more square footage on the house, more extracurricular sports for Billy. <laughs> it's just more, 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 more. Man, if I could just get another raise, God. Man, if I, God, if I get one more raise, I promise I'll give you, give you more. I haven't given you anything with the last four, but if you give me one more, I'm all yours. God gives you what you need. He always has and he always will. And what really impacted me, and I'm not gonna lie, a lot of the things that keep me up at night, a lot of the things that strangle me and choke me and pull me apart are not needs. They're wants. And instead of looking at what God has given me in Jesus, I'm looking at what God has given everybody else. And you might not know this about pastors, but a big one for pastors is, God, God why isn't our church bigger? I, I feel like I'm being faithful. I feel like I'm doing what you call me to do. The, the stuff like that. And it's like, it is, it's these things, and, and most of the things that I'm anxious about are wants. What I want for my daughters, what I want for my career, what I want for this, wants. God will always give you what you need. God didn't come here to grant wishes. 
He came here to meet needs. So, so whatever it is that you're struggling with today, whatever that thing is that's causing anxiety, for you it might be a real thing. Maybe there's a health scare. Maybe there's something going on. But God will always give you what you need. There's, there's actually a quote. Um, I think it's from Isaac Newton where he says, anything that you provide is needed and anything that you don't provide is not. Like if it hasn't happened, I don't need it. That's what you're telling me. And in the last argument Jesus gives in this text is not only is it the permanence of God, not only is it the provisions of God, but I love this one the most. It's the paternity of God. And what I mean by that is that he's not just a God in heaven. He is our father in heaven. He's our father. It literally, remember, this is two disciples now. This is to the 25%, that fourth soil. That's what we said week one. So here in this text, he says that if you have faith in Jesus, there should be no reason to be anxious because in heaven, you don't have just a distant deity. You have a loving father. So, so what that means is regardless of what we are going through, and trust me, I know I've been through some stuff. Regardless of what I'm going through, I should never doubt God's fatherly love. We've said this before, I'll say it again. Even when we don't know what his hand is doing, we should always trust his heart. Because his motivation, according to Jesus, is a fatherly love. A fatherly love. And that's why here in the text, he actually compares his kids, his children, with the Gentiles. He's talking about the people who don't know him. And so listen, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you here. If you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, like you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, you have every reason to be anxious. I don't blame you for being anxious. Because in your wor worldview, whatever worldview it is, you don't have a father in heaven who loves you and cares for you. I want you today, if, 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 if this is God's plan, for you to respond today to the gospel so that you might have a father in heaven. But if, if you're living as if this, this, this is the only life there is, like Ecclesiastes says, there's only life under the sun, then you have every reason. I don't blame you for being anxious. But if you are a child of God and your father is in heaven, it kills anxiety at its root. That God is motivated by fatherly love. And what I love about what Jesus says here in this text, and that's why he ends the way he does, where he says, there's gonna be trouble every day. Don't worry about tomorrow, there's enough trouble today. You see, a lot of times when, when someone talks to you about anxiety, they try to minimize your problem. They try to minimize your trouble. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't minimize the problem he magnifies his power. He, he doesn't minimize your trouble. He magnifies his truth. He doesn't minimize your difficulty. He magnifies his deliverance. And so those are the, the, the three arguments or the three reasons why Jesus says we should not be anxious. So that is the response to anxiety. And I want to conclude this morning by looking at the redirection of anxiety. We've looked at the response, and I want to conclude by looking at the redirection of anxiety. And to do that, I want to read uh, the last part again, Matthew uh, 6, through 34. Jesus says, but seek first, everyone say first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Jesus doesn't just teach us how to respond to our anxiety. He actually teaches us how to redirect it. He, he doesn't just say, hey, stop thinking about whatever's getting you anxious. 
He gives you something different to think about, something better to focus on. That, that's what he is getting after. Jesus says, listen, instead of having a horizontal focus where you are busy essentially storing up treasures on, in er, on earth, instead of having a horizontal focus, instead have a vertical focus. Instead of storing up treasures on earth, instead of seeking your own kingdom, your own worldly kingdom, he says, instead, redirect that focus, redirect your cares, redirect your concern, redirect your metamoneo to greater, to greater treasures and to a greater kingdom. He doesn't just tell you to respond, he tells you to redirect. And then he says, seek, the word there, seek, literally in Greek, it means to desire something, to search for something, to long for something. The word seek there is, is a Greek word for how your heart responds to something that you desire and long for. That's what the word there, seek, means. So, so what he is saying to us in this text is that instead of seeking the things of this world, instead of storing up treasures on earth, instead redirect that focus, that concern, those cares to a heavenly kingdom, God's kingdom. Amen, amen. And the word there first, he says, seek first. The word there first has nothing to do with time. It actually has to do with importance. This is a very important point. Because when we think of first, we think of a to-do list and God's kingdom is the first thing on my list. No, 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 no. Because the problem with a to-do list is that at some point you cross, up the, cross off the first thing and you move on to the next thing. The word there first has nothing to do with time and has everything to do with importance. Literally, what he's saying is, is that, that, that God's kingdom should be central to your life. It should be the hub that all the spokes are connected to. That is what he's getting after when he says that we are to seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus is not saying, hey, get rid of your ambition. He is saying, redirect your ambition. Man, and praise God for that. Because I've always just been naturally wired for ambition. And I remember for a long time when I came to Christianity, I thought, okay, is that, do I just kill that? Like, should I just never be ambitious ever again? But that's why in scripture, ambition is not a bad thing. The Bible always goes out of his way to put the word selfish in front of it when it's talking about sinful. My ambition will either be selfish or it will be selfless. That's why when the disciples are arguing about who's greatest in the kingdom, Jesus doesn't say, who cares about being great? No, no, no. He says, no, in order to be great, serve one another. He doesn't say, don't be great. He's saying, you're just pursuing the wrong greatness. He's not saying, don't have ambition. He's saying, have a godly ambition. Not a selfish one, but a selfless one. That's what he's getting after here. And this is why he tells even Martha, 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 you are worried and concerned about many things. But there's only one thing that is needed. There's only one thing that is necessary. Think about all the things that you are anxious about right now. Like seriously, take, take, just evaluate all those things, whether they are real or perceived. Evaluate those fears. And one day you're going to stand before Jesus and he's only going to ask you about one thing. Only one thing is needed. Only one thing is necessary. And what does he say it is? Him. He says, your sister... Mary has chosen the important thing, the, the needed thing, the necessary thing, which is another way of saying she is seeking God's kingdom and you are seeking your own. He, he, he literally doesn't just help us respond to anxiety. He redirects our anxiety. He says, give all your energy and all your attention and all your effort not into your kingdom and your treasures, but into my kingdom and my treasures. So the question you might be asking is, well, what does it look like for me to seek God's kingdom? Well, what does it actually look like on a day-to-day -day basis for me to seek first, of first importance, the kingdom of God? Well, I think there's two words that need to be defined. One is the word kingdom. Though the word kingdom is not just some faraway place in the heavens. 
But the word kingdom in Greek, it carries the idea of God's rule, of God's authority, of God's presence. So when Jesus says, seek God's kingdom, he's saying, be an agent, be a vessel, be an instrument by which God's kingdom is spread. And then he says, not just his kingdom, but his righteousness. And the word there, righteousness, has to do with the things that meet God's standards, the things that have been commanded by God. So Jesus says, get this, the way you seek his kingdom is by doing the things that he's called you to do. It's by evangelizing. It's by discipling. It's by giving. It's by serving. Listen, if you're here today and you call yourself a Christian, I'm going to make this as crystal clear as I can and give you multiple verses from other places in Scripture that say the same thing. It, it, when, when Jesus says to be, when Paul says to be heavenly minded, when Jesus says earlier to pray for God's kingdom to come, when Jesus says here to seek the kingdom of God, what he is saying is, is behave like a follower of Jesus throughout your entire life. So if you claim to follow Jesus and you are not evangelizing, you are not making a disciple, you are not giving, you are not serving. You are not being a witness in your workplace. That's on you, but you are not seeking God's kingdom. Part of the reason why there's so much anxiety in your life is because your focus is not on the things of God. It's on the things of earth. It's on earthly treasures. It's on your earthly empire. Not God's heavenly kingdom. That, that's what he's saying here. I heard John Maxwell say this once, and I, and, I, and I didn't understand it when I first heard it all those years ago, but I, I understand it now. They asked him, what is the hardest thing about leadership? He said, the hardest thing about leadership is wanting more for people than they want for themselves. It breaks my heart as a pastor when week after week, month after month, year after year, the gospel is preached, discipleship is preached, and people are just, amen, brother, keep, keep it going. I'm not going to do anything with it. But man, wow, he, he, he's better than all the other ones in Memphis. This guy can preach. Being heavenly minded, praying for God's kingdom to come, seeking the kingdom of God is doing the things that Jesus called us to do. It's seeking the person of Jesus. So, so what, part of what that means is being in prayer, worshiping him. Spending time with him. But it's not just seeking the person of Jesus, it's seeking the priorities of Jesus. It's carrying out the plans of Jesus. That's what this says. And that's what this means. He doesn't just help us to respond to anxiety. He helps us to redirect our anxiety, our concern, our care, our attention on a greater kingdom, on greater treasures. And that's why he says, when you give yourself to seeking these things, then God will add the rest. But don't miss it. Those things are additions to God, not replacements of God. They're additions, not replacements. God will add everything else you need. Not everything else you want. See, we don't want God to, a lot of us, we don't want God to add the things we need. We want God to multiply the things we want. But when we seek the kingdom of God, everything else is just addition to, not replacement of. It's the, the example we've used with idolatry that it's like a, the top button. Like if I'm getting ready in the morning, and I get my top button wrong, all the other buttons on my shirt are going to be off. If, if you don't put the first button, which is seek the kingdom of God, none of the other buttons in your life are ever going to align. There's always going to be a disconnect. God says, take care of this button, and I'll take care of the rest. And all those will be in addition to me, not in replacement of me. Here's the thing, though. If I were to end with just telling you to seek the kingdom of God, 
Like if I were to end with this passionate plea to, to seek God's kingdom and to do better and to try harder, I would argue that it would leave you with more anxiety, not less. See, a lot of sermons end right here. Seek the kingdom of God. Go and do more. Go and behave better. Now, not that that command is not in Scripture, but if we were to leave it here, I would argue that it actually leaves you with more anxiety and not less. Why? Because if I left you there, then essentially it would still be up to you. The seeking would be up to you. The pursuing would be up to you. The performing would still be up to you. And if that's the case, then Christianity is like every other religion. But here's the thing that kills anxiety at its root. That before you and I ever even thought about seeking the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God, what scripture tells us is that both the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God first sought us. So, so, so let me unpack this for you. In Matthew 4, Jesus shows up on the scene and the first thing he says, these are the first words Jesus says publicly. He says, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is here. So, so, so don't miss that. The kingdom of God is a lot of things, but one of the things that it is, is that literally Jesus is the embodiment, the personification of the kingdom of God. Jesus is the kingdom of God. You see, but then in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, sorry, 1 verse 30, we are told that in the gospel, Jesus isn't just the kingdom of God, but he is the righteousness of God. So please don't miss this. According to scripture, Jesus is both the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. He's both. The kingdom of God and the righteousness of God is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. So why is that important to us? And why does that kill anxiety at its root? Well, the reason why it's important and the reason why it kills anxiety at its root is because the only way we will ever seek Jesus is when we understand that he first sought us. As a matter of fact, the same Greek word that's used in this text where he says, seek first the kingdom of God is the same Greek word used in Luke 19. And in Luke 19 verse 10, we are told Jesus is talking about his mission here on earth. And Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Same Greek word. Same exact Greek word. And that's why the gospel is different from any other religion. That's why Christianity is different from any other religion. Because what we see is that the only way we can ever seek Jesus is when we understand that he first sought us. The only way we will ever love Jesus is when we understand that he first loved us. The only way we will ever treasure Jesus is when we understand that he first treasured us, that he first cherished us, that he first pursued us. This passage is not ultimately about us seeking the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. This passage is about the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God first seeking us. Amen. Come on. Yeah. And, and this is why we have to be careful when we come to God and, and, and we, we, we doubt his love. Because remember, anxiety at its root is not just a replacement of God, it's a doubting of God. God literally is looking at us right now. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, whether it's big, uh, whether it's big or it's small, I need you to understand that God is looking at you and saying, if I did not withhold my son, if I did not withhold my grace, if I did not withhold my forgiveness and my mercy and my love, if I did not withhold that, why would I withhold now? You see, see, if in the passage, Jesus argues from the lesser to the greater in the gospel, he argues from the greater to the lesser. If God did not withhold any of those things, why would he withhold now? 
God literally has bought you the most expensive gift in the universe and you're worried about the wrapping paper. <laughs> How crazy is it when we go to God and say, hey, I trust you with eternal life, I just don't trust you in the current life. I trust you with heaven, I just don't trust you with my health. I trust that I'm your child, I just don't trust you with my child. God looks at us and says, if you have ever doubted me, if you have ever questioned me, and like I said, we are most tempted to doubt. We are most tempted to question in those times of suffering, in those times of shaking. He says, if you have ever doubted or questioned me, look at the cross. If you have ever doubted my love, look at the cross. If you have ever doubted my care, look at the cross. If you have ever doubted my heart, look at the cross. Look at it, behold it, consider it. And the more you do, the more you will realize is that whatever it is that you're going through, it's not because I'm punishing you. It's not because I hate you. It's not because I'm forsaking you. That's what this means if you are in Christ. And so if you're in this season and you're thinking, how in the world can God use this evil, this, this bad thing for good? How? That's actually one of the reasons why people can't come to God. They see suffering in the world. They're like, how can God use this thing, this, this bad, evil thing for good? Well, guess what? The worst thing that's ever happened in human history, which was the death of his son, was used for the best thing. The worst thing ever resulted in the best thing ever. So if he did it there, why wouldn't he do it now? And so what we have to be careful of, and this is why the gospel is so important, this is why we have to constantly be preaching the gospel to ourselves and to, and to, and to one another, because we, like one author talks about this idea of re-evangelization. We have to be re-evangelizing our hearts, our heads and our hearts, because literally what we know is that God will not abandon us because he already abandoned Jesus. God will not forsake us because he already forsook Jesus. God will not turn away from us because he already turned away from Jesus. God wasn't there for Jesus in his lowest moment so that he might be able to be there for you and yours. That is the gospel. That is what Jesus is calling us to. And here's what I'll say. In the passage, he brings up the idea of Solomon. He brings up King Solomon. Now to us, we, many of you have heard of King Solomon and his stories, but to, to, to the Jews, outside of King David, King Solomon was the man. He was wise, he was strong, he was rich. Like if, if Jews had a say, they would want Jesus to bring that type of reign back. That's what we learned during Palm Sunday. But what's beautiful about Jesus is that he is a greater king who came to bring a greater kingdom. And we know that because there's another place in Matthew where Jesus says, someone greater than Solomon is here. And you've missed it. You're so focused horizontally, you're so focused on your earthly kingdoms that someone greater than Solomon is here and you missed it. Our King Jesus Christ is greater than Solomon. He is wiser than Solomon. He is stronger than Solomon. He is closer than Solomon. That's who we have. We have in the gospel a greater king and a greater kingdom. And what I love about God is that in this passage, he doesn't meet our perceived needs. He meets our actual needs. See, God didn't just come to deal with your physical nakedness. He came to deal with your spiritual nakedness. God didn't just come to deal with your physical hunger. He came to deal with your spiritual hunger. He didn't just come to deal with your uh, physical thirst. He came to deal with your spiritual thirst. He didn't just come to deal with our physical poverty, but with our spiritual poverty. And that's why 
what the gospel teaches is that in the gospel, we're not just given clothes, we're given robes of righteousness. In the gospel, we're not just given food, we are given the bread of heaven. In the gospel, we're not just giving, given water, we are given the living water. And in the gospel, we're not just giving, given riches, we are given spiritual riches. The more you allow that, the more you consider that, the more you behold that, the more you look at that, the more you ponder that, the more you meditate on that at the, at the head level, then over time, again, because you, you gotta learn it, over time it starts to affect you at the, 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 the heart level and you finally are able to get off God's throne. And over time you are finally able to take off his crown and let go of his reins and open up your hands again. God is so good that in this passage, he gives us rational arguments for our head, gospel affections for our hearts, and kingdom actions for our hands. Amen. 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 What an incredibly powerful sermon Absolutely. this morning. I can't wait for us to dive into it together. Yeah. Um, we want to welcome you this morning to Church at Home. My name is Whitney Clay, and this is Stephen Lyles. Hey, guys. And we're so glad that you guys are here. Um, we've just heard some incredible truth, which I think has probably ministered to all of us, which is awesome. And so we want to dive into that with you. But I want to let you know that Olivia is moderating. She's right over here. She's been talking with us too about what the Lord's been teaching her. Um, and so we would love for you to chat with her, spend some time talking to her, let her know what the Lord is teaching you. I know a lot of you have been chatting with her as well. And we know that we have some people um, watching in town, but also a lot of people out of town. And so if that's you and, and we don't know who you are, we would love for you to fill out this QR code that's right above Stephen's head. Somewhere over here. <laughs> and you can take a picture of it with your phone or you you can go to highpointonline.com slash respond. So highpointonline.com slash respond and just let us know who you are. We would love to reach out to you, connect with you, get to know you and figure out how we can kind of help you as you're being a part of church at home. So, yeah. um, but we're so glad that you're here today. And I know um, the Lord's been teaching us a lot. <laughs> We've been sharing a lot right. this morning. Um, but one of the things you said stood out to you, we talked about um, anxiety and worry today, which we realize we kind of all deal with, whether it's clinical or general. We've or all, both. Yeah. Yes, we're both. We've all had worries and anxieties that we struggle with. Um, and you mentioned this verse in First Peter that he mentioned in his sermon. Yeah, absolutely. So um, First Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And it just, it just spoke to me that um, we cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us, mm -hmm. not it's not we cast all our cares upon him, then he cares for us. Right. It's because he cares. He's already cared. He's already loved us like we heard this yes. morning. And so it just jumped out at me and it's such a, a, a blessing to know that we can give him all our cares because he loves us. Yeah. You know? I wrote so. down, he said, what, and these are my notes. He says, what kills anxiety at, at its roots is that before we sought the kingdom and righteousness of God is that the kingdom of God and righteousness of God sought, sought us. us. Yeah. And yeah. how Jesus came after us like Absolutely. he sought us and that puts that in such perspective right there's nothing we're doing in that to earn or deserve anything it's already been done and so we can lay those cares at his feet yeah the gospel done instead of the religion do right, right. Yeah. exactly yeah. <laughs> and i what really i stood out to me is philippians 4 6 and 7 yeah if you want to read that for us yeah let me, let me get it real quick um Six and seven, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, will, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, and one of the questions that Pastor Will gave us today um, that'll come up at the end for you guys to discuss for Church at Home, he said, we're called not to be anxious about anything, according to Philippians 4, 6, and 7, right. but to instead pray about everything. Why is prayer such a vital tool when it comes to casting our cares on God? If that's the case, then why is it so hard for us to pray? Yeah. And for me, I think um, it all goes back. We talked about the control, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm overly anxious and overly concerned, I want to hold on to it instead of just caring. 
And then I like how you said that you just also throw it away. You're like, well, okay, I just right. won't care. But for me, it's it's this attempt to control. Like yeah. I'm going to control my my little kingdom yeah. right where I am, and I'm going to control it. And so prayer, though, reorients my thinking. And it like he talked about, this is a thinking passage. Sure. And so it puts God in perspective, and it allows me to realize that he is sovereign, that he is faithful, that he loves me, that he is trustworthy, because I can look at the cross, like yeah. he said, and I can see that. Um, but I ha- prayer does that for me. It reorients that when I lay it at his feet. And I loved how he said that anxiety puts us on the throne. And so we take on all his concerns. And <laughs> yeah. I was like, Oh, I don't, that's why I'm so worried. I don't yeah. want that. I don't need those concerns right. of the Lord. Well, and I love that. He said, when you try to take on God's throne, you that's also have I mean. to take his thoughts yes. or his, uh, when you take on his crown, you have to take all of his cares. Like I was like, Whoa, I know, but that's what anxiety <laughs> yeah. feels like. Cause yeah. it's like, we're the ones in control and that's our attempt. Right. When really we can't do that. Right. Um, and I loved how he said that if you are, if you're not in Christ, like if you don't know Jesus, then you have every reason to be anxious. And for us this morning, my heart is burdened for you, for where you are. And so maybe today you're sitting there and you're thinking, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I've never realized that he's done all those things Mm -hmm. and that I don't have to do anything to earn it, that I can just come to him. And if that's you today, if you have questions about that, about what it means to walk with Jesus, we would love to help you do that, to know what it means to accept him as your Lord and your savior and to have a God who's trustworthy and who sits on the throne and that you can give those cares to. Um, And then, you know, thinking on the other end, we all are kind of walking this journey together. And especially when it comes to anxiety, how can we continually remind ourselves like to give those things over to the Lord? And that's, maybe that's you today. You need that constant reminder. And I loved how he gave us like, practical applications sure. for kind of each and everything along the yeah, way. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. He, he talks about, um, you know, seeking God and what does that, what does that look like day mm-hmm. to day? Uh, and it, I just love, he kind of gives you just kind of three points and he says, be an agent of which God's kingdom is spread. Like, and I was like, mm-hmm. that's so good. Yeah. Like, I just want to be an agent of God's kingdom. That's so good. Um, be a, behave like a follower mm. of Jesus by serving, giving, evangelism, discipleship. Not that those things save us, but those things say to us, say to Jesus, like, thank you for what you've done. Like it's in, it's in gratitude that we're doing those things. Um, and that we, um, we, to be heavenly minded, right. To Mm -hmm. seek the person of Jesus, the priorities of Jesus, the plans of Jesus. It's just so good. Yeah. Um, so practical when we when we think of it that way. And I, I kind of thought along those lines that if I'm concerned about the things of the kingdom, of his kingdom, then I'm less likely to be concerned yeah. about the things of mine. That's like right. <laughs> if yeah. I'm if I'm you know focused on him and he's yeah. in his proper place and I'm serving him in those areas, right. then it's less time for me to try to control everything and try to worry about everything. Right. He, and he, I liked when he said, "Think about all the things you're anxious about, like right now." And he said, "At the end of the day, Jesus is only going to ask you about one thing. Like what mm. what did you do for his kingdom?" Yeah. And I was like, "Wow, that's powerful." Because there's a lot of other things that take my attention, right? And they're, and they're not bad things. But ultimately, how am I keeping my focus on him? Yeah, and I think it goes back to what we've talked about a lot over this, this, this you know, Sermon on the Mount series. And that is, is that it's not about self. Mm-hmm. And we try to make everything about us. And it's yes. about our kingdom and our wants and not our needs. And, you know, he talked about that today. So I think that's super important us to continue to go back and remember yeah. that this is God's story. And it's not just about me. You know. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I liked um, at the end of his sermon, um, he was talking about putting those things, you know, in the proper perspective. And he said, when we realize those things, then we can take off the th- the crown and get out of the throne yeah. and let God do His work, oh, right? Wow. And let Him yeah. and do His work in our lives too and through us. And um, he said this really stuck out to me because we always try to talk about head, heart, hands. Yeah. And he said that this passage gives us ra- rational arguments for our head. Mm-hmm. And I loved how he really focused on that in the beginning. Like he's he wants us to look at other things, think about other things. It's not just emotion, it's thinking. This passage is practical. And then gospel affections for our heart. So there's yeah. gospel truth in there. And then the kingdom actions for our hands, which yeah. is exactly what you're talking about. That right. when I'm busy doing those things, then my mind can focus on him, you right. know? And I love that uh, Pastor Will always ends with the gospel. Like mm-hmm. he always, always ends with the gospel. He he said it today. He said, I could leave it there, <laughs> but that wouldn't be the good news. Right. Like the good news is, is that 
God's already done it. Mm-hmm. Like God's done the work. Uh, and we just need to lean into that. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, the practical stuff is really great. What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? It's really great to look at the practical things. But the, the gospel is mm-hmm. the good news is it's the gospel done. Yes. It's so good. Yeah. And we were talking beforehand about how we've heard sermons like this before. Yeah. And it's all just do better, be better, yeah. get your stuff in order. <laughs> you know, like clean yourself up. And that's, you, I loved how you said that's not the gospel. Yeah, like, that's not, not the good news yeah. because there's nothing we can do. And maybe that's freeing for you today. Maybe you've never heard that before, <laughs> but there's literally nothing that you can do to, to make yourself better to come to Jesus. Right. There's nothing that you can do to earn his love. And that's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Absolutely. And so for you today, as you're sitting there, like I said, maybe you're, you're these things are kind of clicking <laughs> and you're like, I need this. I need to know him. We would love to help you walk through that. Olivia would love to talk to you about that too. You, fill out the response card. We would love to get together with you, talk with you about that decision. But maybe today you're a believer like us and you've been walking with Jesus and you're still struggling with anxiety. Yeah. And the, the beautiful thing today is that the gospel addresses that. Like it speaks to our head, our heart, and our hands and how we can reorient our focus on him. You know, and we continually talk about in church, at church at home, about community and how we love for you to be in community with people around you, mm-hmm. your neighbors. If you're far off and you can't be here on campus with us, then, you know, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite your family, have a community because that's really where change happens. That's yes. really where, you know, you need to be is in community. But if you're here in the area, in Memphis, in Collierville, uh, come see us, yeah. come visit us. We'd love to, to meet you. Um, to get to see you, and it's been amazing to to be part of this community, and to know that we have people who care about us and love us, and we care about you, and we love you, and we want g- good things for you. We want the gospel for you. Yes, we would love, like you said, if you're local, for you to come regather with us. Our East Memphis and Carville campuses meet at nine and eleven on Sundays, yeah. and then if you're outside of the area, or if you're inside the area and you just can't join us for whatever reason. Do what Stephen said. Invite some friends over. Talk to them about the sermon. Um, Talk with your family. And I I was thinking, too, this sermon is a really practical one. I know I'm going to share it. (laughs) I actually already have shared it with some people because I'm like, this was such good gospel truth and a gospel reminder for me. And, you know, the areas where maybe I claim to trust Jesus, but I'm holding on like this. And it's like, how can I just let go? And one of the beautiful things about being in community with people is you can talk about those things. And you have people you can share them with who are praying for you. And that's what we want for you today. So if we can help you do that in any way, we would love to. We'd love to help you figure out what your next step is here at High Point Church at Home. Um, But we love you guys. And we're praying today that um, the gospel truth really resonates with your head because this is a thinking battle, right? And also with your heart, with your emotions, and then with your hands that you're able to actually do the work of the kingdom. Um, But we love you guys. And we're praying for you today, praying for the truth that's been spoken over you today. And as you discuss that in community. So we love you guys and we'll see you next week. See ya.